Hi. Uh, Mike Chisholm, host of the Letterman podcast. Um, and I, this is not a Letterman related video. So for those who are coming on, I, this is my YouTube channel, the only real YouTube channel I have. So I'm going to post this video on here. Um, so I'm the host of the Letterman podcast, but for the Letterman enthusiasts who uh, normally come on uh, to this YouTube channel and enjoy our videos, this is not Letterman related. This is a pro wrestling related thing. Um, uh, I think I've mentioned on the show before, I have um, a pro wrestling promotion that I helped co-found and, and re helped run for um, uh, eight years, I guess, seven years, eight years. Uh, we ran shows locally in my market of Kelowna, British Columbia. We, we brought in a big wrestling star and then we would have local wrestlers be a part of it. We did it for charity. We raised over a quarter million dollars for um, local charities in, in six or seven years. I have a financial practice. Most people, when they give back uh, in that, genre of business they do it with like golf tournament or a walk it's just not my my style uh, i got into pro wrestling so because of that um i was invited into a fraternity that's been around since i believe the 50s called cauliflower alley and there's a reunion every year and uh, this year i got not just invited to go but uh, in previous years i've been asked to um to host panels different panels and this year's i year this year i got a chance to do that with a with a wrestler named JBL, John Bradshaw Layfield. Those who are no wrestling, no JBL. He was a champion for a long time. Took the belt from Eddie Guerrero, had it for a couple of years, lost it to John Cena uh, as he was rising up and as his star was taking off. John, uh, tremendous, tremendous talent in the ring. I got a chance to interview him. Now, at this reunion, there was an event that happened. There's a very famous pro wrestler uh, by the name of CM Punk, who arguably is at the top of his game right now. Uh, many call, including himself in the past, the best pro wrestler in the world. Phenomenal, phenomenal athlete and um, worker. Uh, so at Cauliflower Alley this year, at the reunion, uh, there's a dinner that happens. And and at the dinner, um, CM Punk gave, he received a, an award and did a speech. Um, it turns out that he has just um, left the promotion AEW. And it's big news in the wrestling world. I happened to be right up front and I uh, captured this entire speech on video. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an enthusiast of CM Punk. I, I really love his work. Um, it's funny, you know, it was the Letterman podcast, but some of the reasons why I love David Letterman as a broadcaster are some of the reasons why I love uh, CM Punk as a, a performer in, in, in professional wrestling or sports entertainment, however you look at it, um, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, Punk in his name, the name Punk, he's, he's very punk rock. Um, Dave, I think in many respects was that way as well as a broadcaster, um, marches to the beat of his own drum, CM Punk does. And, uh, this, this speech that he gave was incredible. Um, and, and after the speech, he, he went and hugged some people, uh, Rob Van Dam and JBL and Ron Simmons. And he shouted out Cowboy Bob Orton, who was in the audience and some other people. Again, if you're a Letterman enthusiast, you're like, why are you doing this, Mike? Well, I actually got the whole thing and, and I think it makes, I think a lot of wrestling fans will want to see this video. And this is the only YouTube channel I have. So I'm going to put the video out here and that way folks can enjoy it. Um, I had a moment with, uh, with punk myself and uh, it, it, it doesn't really work anymore because I asked him to look out for somebody who came and worked for us a couple of times, a young wrestler. Um, and, and, uh, and I asked him if he would look out for, for this young man. Um, you know, uh, moving forward in AEW. Well, he's no longer with AEW. So those, um, that moment, unfortunately, you know, isn't uh, what I thought it might be, but uh, the speech itself was incredible. And so I'm just going to post it right here. So here is the, uh, uh, the speech that CM Punk made from a pretty good vantage point. I was kind of right up front um, that CM Punk made at the Cauliflower Alley uh, reunion. Enjoy. <laughs> Here to adopt and present the guy who might deserve the award to see a punk from the Steel Domain Training School to the Second City Saints to present day. Oh, he has been one of his closest friends, well respected coach, producer, wrestler, trainer. Please welcome Ace Steel! Well, we got your time. We got five. 
the Iron Mike will serve you award this year for 2023 for outstanding achievement in the ring and beyond the ring goes to Phil Brooks, Skip Pop. Holy shit, we 
suck. <laughs> but I had gone out and gotten a promoter's license because the only thing I knew was punk rock. I knew do it yourself. I know if you wanted to do something, if I wanted to be in a band, go to the pawn shop, maybe, yeah. maybe borrow an instrument. <laughs> I didn't know there was wrestling schools. The internet wasn't really a huge thing yet. I met a steel and a guy named Danny Dominion in the bathroom of the Rosemont Horizon at a WWF house show. They gave me a business card, and I was like, what is this, a wrestling school? Huh. Yeah, I didn't know you had to go to school. I had heat on me because I was a backyard wrestler. I showed up to beat the crap out of me. And it's been a love affair ever since. From there, I wrestled every weekend I possibly could. Nothing mattered, girlfriends, jobs, responsibilities, the only thing that I cared about was getting in a car with whoever I could and driving anywhere. And we were lucky because we were in Chicago. We were very central. I could drive to Michigan at the Upper Peninsula. I could cross over into Canada until I got thrown out the first time. <laughs> you could go to Minnesota. You could drive down to Kentucky, Indiana. 13, 14, 15 hour drives to Philadelphia. We went everywhere. Now this is back at the time when had to write down a resume, put a couple of promos and matches on a VHS tape and send them out. And promoters would call you. And <laughs> Mickey knows. And you would get and you would get booked. And I think the first match that I would say kind of put me on the map was when I got to wrestle two guys, Ray Mysterio Jr. and a man by the name of Eddie Guerrero. I wish Ray was here, he appears to have left. That's fine, <laughs> I understand that. Right, right. There's a lot of people out of show here. I wish Steve Kern was here. He's not dead, he's just in Florida. That might be worse. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, 90% of the rest of us in the world live and are from Florida, so I know. I was fortunate enough to meet Eddie Guerrero, I think it was maybe 2001, and man, this guy, this guy changed my life. He, he was so kind and he was sweet. He was going through it. He had just been fired. He was going through a divorce. He was worried about seeing his kids. Uh, but all he knew was wrestling. So he was on the road. He was working independent shots. He was getting booked in New Japan. And I remember meeting him for the first time and him looking at me and saying, I don't like three ways that don't make any sense to me. If it's okay with you, you and Ray put it together and just call us. I had very limited experience with going out and just kind of winging it. You know, I'm an indie kid. We would sit down and map everything out from A to B. And man, if you got concussed or the ring broke or you know a riot broke out or something, something happened, you didn't know how to save or how to say. You learn on the you, you learn on the fly. But Eddie that night made me realize how garbage I actually was, but made me feel like man. There's so much room for improvement. And if this guy is willing to step in the ring with me wearing basketball shorts and Doc Martens, I need to up my game to show him respect. Because none of this is about me. I stand on the shoulders of giants, literally. I would not be able to do any of this if it wasn't for people like Eddie Guerrero for people like Tracy Smothers. I wish Chris Candido was here. And I am now, I am now at the age where, unfortunately, my contemporaries are passing away. Jay Briscoe, Britt Wyatt, two people who should still be with us, two people who I consider to be young, still. Terry Funk recently just passed away. I was fortunate to know Terry Funk. Man, Terry Funk lived a life. I think if you would ask Terry right before he went, are you ready to go? He would have told you he was ready to go 10 years ago. <laughs> but Bray, Jay Briscoe, I don't think they were ready, so I think it's important to remember them. <laughs> the first name I ever worked in the rest of the business was Tracy Smith. 
was scared to death because he came up to me in the locker room and he said, oh, hey, man, hey, oh, you look good, you swim, you eat cans of tuna, you lift weights, do a limp lift, oh, man, listen, listen, man, I see those matches you have with Ace and with, with uh, Chris Hero, man, all that stuff you do, oh, God, I can't do any of that, I can't remember any of that either, so it's okay with y'all. Is it okay if we just call it out there? And I acted cool, like, sure. <laughs> We'll just walk and talk, baby. <laughs> I was terrified. And when I saw him in the ring, and he ran outside me to grab the fans' nachos and their cheese, and I knew I was wrestling in a barn in southern Indiana with a five and a half hour drive ahead of me, no shower. I was like, this son of a bitch is going to cover me in nacho cheese. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk about this. This was cool. And he grabbed me, and he grabbed that nacho cheese, and he said, Walk the cheese, brother. <laughs> and a light bulb went off in my head. I said, this guy is just talking to me. This is amazing. I mean, I don't have to talk to people before the show. I just saw so many of my problems. That began the part of my career where I would actively hide from my opponents. Yeah. All of that independent wrestling and traversing the United States Japan, going to Puerto Rico, going to Europe. Back when you had to smuggle merch into Europe and you were terrified because you were just a 19, 20 year old kid and you're reading the declaration thing and you're like, did you have more than $10,000? And you're like, oh shit. If I sell too many t shirts, they're going to get me on the way back. <laughs> Nobody's ever taught me about any of this stuff. God damn it. I, I landed a spot in Ring of Honor. And it's the first time I ever met Mickey James, who's the Korea, Korea, she's like a red ass She's like, she's not a bad penny, but a good man. She keeps coming back. I met Mickey James for the first time. Eddie Guerrero was still wrestling there. I learned from a guy named Raven. And I learned, yeah. and listen, I know, I know a lot of people, they might not like Raven. Here's a little secret, too. A lot of people might not like me. But Raven, coupled with the things that Eddie has taught me, and Tracy had taught me, and Ace taught me, and you mix it up with what Raven taught me. He's like, ah, kid, listen, ah, it's not about the moves. The first time I ever wrestled Raven, if I may afford some of your time for this ridiculous story, he got a ridiculous <laughs> amount of color on one of those Wednesday night TNA pay-per-views, right? And I'm wrestling for, for Norm Connors IWC. You were probably there, Joe. I think you were 12. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the 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 the, the, the Crockett era Ric Flair just athletic tape on his head, and he's sitting there, and I've never met him before, and I walk up to him, and I'm like, oh, hello, sir, hi, you know, my name's my name's Punk, you know, whatever you want to do. He's like, ah, just tell me a couple things you do, kid. Ah, uh, you know, make a little business, man. As I'm talking to him, he just starts <laughs> leaking. <laughs> he hasn't done anything, but he got such great color. Wednesday night at the Nashville Fairgrounds, he's leaking. And I'm looking yeah. at him and I'm like, you're bleeding. And he goes, ah, shit. There's a match about to go out. Some kid's about to debut. Raven grabs him and he goes, ah, sorry, kid, we gotta go. And he's just like, start fighting. And we start, we start brawling and we go through the curtain. He's already bleeding. He's like, we gotta go. So once again, thank you, Tracy Smothers. Thank you, Eddie Guerrero. Thank you, Ace Steele. You have given me the knowledge to not be afraid of going out and doing something on the fly with this man that I had just met and never wrestled before. He's bleeding. I start chopping the shit out of him. And he's going, eh! Eh! He starts giving me a shoulder. And I'm like, this motherfucker, you know? Stop giving me your shoulder. I'm trying to I'm waffling this shit up. A little lesson learned. We get the back and he goes, eh, kid, come here. Listen, chops are stupid. They hurt. And they suck. And don't ever chop me again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Doing good, but we didn't talk about it, so you know, I didn't know. Armed with the new knowledge that I got from Raven and so many others, I continue to wrestle. Tommy Dreamer calls me one day and he says, "The WWE wants to take a look at you." And I said, "Shut the fuck up." <laughs> this is. 2004, maybe. He says, no, they really, really do. I was 
was doing dark matches, Tom Pritchard was booking extra talent, and he said they legitimately want to take a look at me. And I thought, well, this is the chance. WWF to me was never the goal. I looked up to people who went to Japan to wrestle. I thought the idea of going to Japan and being a superstar, like a Bruce Brody or a Stan Hansen or an Eddie Guerrero, and then coming home and nobody knowing who you are, man, I thought that was the coolest idea in the world. That's what I wanted. When I wrestled in Japan, Hashimoto told me, maybe too big cruiserweight, too small heavyweight. My dreams dashed against the rocks, but Tommy called. And I said, Tommy, if they legitimately want to look at me, I said, I'm not, I'm not a WWE guy. You know, I'm a skinny fat, Hunter famous who called me that on TV. He wasn't wrong. I wore basketball shorts. I dedicated myself, I, I told Tommy, Tommy, I said, give me, give me six to eight months. I'm gonna bust my ass and I'm gonna get in the shape and I'm gonna do everything I can to when they legitimately take a look at me, they will not be able to say no. And in the line of this, none of this being about me, I wanna thank Val Venus. I had a match with him on Sunday Night Key that, yeah. that got me my job. And I knew it got me. People will tell me that I'm cocky, and I know sometimes I am, but I knew leaving that ring, I said, I'm almost at abs, J.D., believe it or not. <laughs> you said something up here yesterday that really resonated with me. You gotta work out hard to look this bad. <laughs> <laughs> the same is true for me. So I'm offered a job, and I'm blown away. And I pack up everything I own. In my 2001 Monte Carlo, which is the first thing I ever bought with my own money. I'm gonna jump back in time. I'm gonna jump back in time really quick here. The 2001 Monte Carlo, I don't know if anybody's ever heard the story about Harley Race in my 2001 Monte Carlo. The first time I ever met Harley Race, he was a special guest referee for a match I had in Wisconsin. And Harley comes up to me before the match and he goes, Hey, kid, don't you do any of that one, two, one, two, one, two bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get up and down as fast as I used to. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think Harley wanted to count my Bronco Lewis just yet. <laughs> and he too much pride. And I was terrified of Harley Race. This is the toughest man in professional wrestling he's ever seen. Sorry, Haku. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I would get taken over in a headline takeover, Harley would come over and he'd go, What do you say? And he would stick his index and his middle finger straight up in both my nostrils. <laughs> And I, was, and I was just a, a young 20-something punk kid looking at the lights going, why is Harley Race doing this? <laughs> and if you've ever met Harley, Harley had legit hands of steel, and his fingers were like sausages. So to actually jam his fingers in my nose, it hurt quite a lot. I was about as Harley Race. Harley Race liked me for some reason, and I didn't get it. Tracy Smothers liked me for some reason, and I didn't know why. I never fit in anywhere before. Eddie Guerrero loved me, and I never knew why. Later that night at the bar, Harley Race is accepting shots from every single fan. He's getting loaded, but if you know anything about Harley Race, you know this guy can get loaded. His loaded is a different planet than anybody else's loaded, right? But Harley was a little bit older. He wasn't the legendary Harley from the 70s. Sure, he could probably drink hard. I think he might have got to him a little bit. Ace comes up to me and he goes, hey, can you stick around? We'll just take Harley back to the hotel later. I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So it's later that night. Harley comes out of the bar. We're walking in the car. And I'm watching Harley. It sounds very disrespectful to say he was waddling. 
but it had a lot more to do with the state of inebriation than it did with his body type or anything else. And Harley waddles out of the bar and he stops and he gives me, he gives me one of these. <laughs> <laughs> My brand new 2001 line car was the first thing I ever bought with my own money. Six shotgun he sits in the back seat of the ride to the hotel. And I'm looking at Harley, and all of a sudden he goes, <laughs> And I'm driving my car, and I'm just like, There's no way. It's the hardest man in professional wrestling history. This man can hold his alcohol. <laughs> Rolls the window down turns and a noise I will never forget as long as I live. He says and spits a mouthful of vomit out the window and I'm driving I feel like a good pace. It immediately blows back all over a steel. And I look at a rigid mirror and I'm just like holy shit. And I look at Harley and he does it again. And he slowly turned, like, I don't think Harley had a quick bump in his body. Everything was like, he slowly turned to the window and he went, <laughs> like a balloon deflated. So I start to pull over. He does it again. But this time, since I'm pulling over, he turns to me. Oh, no. <laughs> Swallows. And, and grabs my forearm and says, Don't pull over. You'll lower the authorities. <laughs> <laughs> this continues the entire way to this hotel room. We get to the hotel room, we walk in, and we <laughs> I'm thinking, I gotta tell this motherfucker to bed. You know what I mean? Like, but we get to the we get to the elevator and he turns to me, he's covered in puke, and he says, Well, my friend, I hope you have it in your heart to forgive me for throwing up in your car. <laughs> and I said, Yeah, man, you're on the race. <laughs> and then he proceeded to give me a big hug. It's 
our faith. And Coco, it warms my heart to know that I got the same phone call you did. Yours just was a couple of decades earlier. Howard Finkel's on the phone and he goes, Hello, senior monk. I can't do a Howard Finkel impression. I'm not going to do one. Uh, he tells me that I'm booked for Monday Night Raw. Now, I wrestled Saturday night and I'm like, oh shit, it is like 9 in the morning, Sunday morning. What, what do I got to do? He says, we're in Cleveland. And I was like, Howard, I just drove all night. Like, if you would have called me five hours ago, I would have been in Cleveland. I just would have pulled over. He said, don't worry about the flight Monday morning. Great. So I get, I get home. I rest. Monday morning, my first day on the job. I show up to the rental car uh, desk in Cleveland, Ohio, and there's Mickey James. And I go, Mickey, what are you doing here? And she's like, they're calling me up, and I heard, is it me and you? Are we doing something? And I went, I don't know. So we rode together to the building, and we get there, and somebody comes up to us, and they says, you guys are on Sunday night key. Kids in the audience that used to be a little show. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> so me and Mickey get told that uh, we're we're together, but we're running around. Do you remember Alex, SmackDown writer? Okay, Alex could Alex Greenfield. Yeah, Alex Greenfield. He couldn't tell me shit. He was like, "You guys are together," and I went. Me and Mickey got together. We're like, "Great, are we brother and sister?" Are we married? Are we together? Are we like Mickey and Mallory from Natural Born Killer? I just started looking at you know, And as we're talking, Michael Hayes walks by and goes, CM Punk, I'm kidding. <laughs> first, first day on the job, and I look at Mickey, and Mickey's been busting her ass in Ohio Valley Wrestling. And I looked at Mickey, and I was just like, oh man, pressure's on. I can't fumble this fucking ball because it's her career. Uh, Hunter comes up to all of us as you just thankfully reminded me. And he looks at me and he goes, you, I can. And then he looks at me and he goes, you, I can. He goes, together? Because I don't fucking get it now. He walks away. <laughs> so to set the table, Debuting, Mickey's debuting. Uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to be a baby face. I have purple hair. Yeah. And we're in Cleveland, and they're gonna announce me from Chicago. And I just, you know, I got like shitty tattoos, and I'm with the hot girl with the big boobs. And I just remember pulling Mickey aside, going, "This isn't gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> this is they're gonna they're gonna boo the shit out of me." And you're going to take us straight for this one. We came up with a elaborate entrance, and I think we even might have kissed. And that was the kiss of death. The instant I kissed you in front of Cleveland, they might have started throwing fucking garbage at me. I proceeded to have an eh, okay match, but it wasn't up to snuff. And I remember getting it back, and Arn and Hunter and Sean were just kind of standing in the corner. And it felt like high school because they were all just like kind of pointing. I knew they were talking about me, and I was just like, And then, and then I got sent to Ohio Valley Wrestling, and I figured six months tops. You never would have got to meet me, JBL. How sad. But the best thing about being at OVW is I got to work with Danny Davis. And I don't know, is there a reason in my career? I don't know why Danny, like, all these old school guys, all these tough guys, I don't know why they put up with me, and I don't know why they like me. Paul Heyman would allow me to come to the Davis Arena on Tuesday night and help write the television show. Because my thing was, I'm never getting called up. I, I, that was my one chance. Back then, with all those names on the roster that I listed, it was, it was just a shark tank. You weren't going to get a shot. And I figured that was my one shot. But as long as I was going to be in that house, I was going to learn as much as I could from Danny Davis and Paul Hannon. And Paul spent his time and taught me how to write a television show. He taught me how to time a television show. He taught me half a second out, half a second in for commercial. Danny Davis and Paul let me sit in the control room with them and learn how to edit a television 
television show Wednesday night. This is when I started drinking coffee. I developed insomnia. That is not a joke. That is real life. I figured I had six months. I was going to learn as much as I possibly could. And when I was back on the Indies, I was going to apply that. Uh, I slipped through the cracks. Paul Heyman got me in and got me on television. Somehow with CM Punk, I figured I was going to be an astronaut or a farmer or <laughs> something. But to me, that meant it's not that Vince didn't care. It's just that he didn't care enough about me or ECW that I was able to slip under the radar with CM Punk. I was CM Punk, 15 years old, wrestling in the backyard. I had no business being on WWE television with these giants and these legends wrestling as CM Punk, but I did. And JBL, I don't know, they put the title out there. I want money in the bank. I was in the right place at the right time. And, you know, this guy who, let's be honest, people would tell horror stories about him, okay? He's the only, I, I, I remember having a match with Batista and you. And I'm, I'm the little guy, I'm taking bumps, but I'm supposed to be a baby face and I'm supposed to be the champion. But it was, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting shit kicked out of me. I'm getting powerbombed. You're Larry, I mean, you know, it was, the, it was the job. And I remember laying there and they kind of threw the title on me. This is the main event. It just wasn't working. There's two household name superstars and a new guy who probably didn't deserve the gold at the time. And I was laying there thinking, well, this sucks for me, but like, I mean, I understand the position I'm in. So, you know, I don't know, back to the drawing board. And you marched back to the ring, unannounced, didn't tell anybody you were doing this, didn't tell me, you got in the ring, you picked me up, and I was like, oh, he's just gonna close my big head. <laughs> and you shot me off the ropes and you said, duck one GTS. And I was just like, first guy to do that for me. Thank you. Yeah. Like I said, you know, I like Tracy's mother, like all these other people that I've watched on television that I wanted to emulate. This is somebody who I thought, never in a million years, would like me. For some reason, he did. I don't know. I don't know if I, at some some point along the way, I gained your respect. I gained Taker's respect. And that is the point of all this, because none of this is about me. This is about the people who came before me. And I miss a lot of them. I miss Eddie. I miss Chris Candido. I miss Tracy Smothers. I miss Harley Race. I miss Terry Funk. But it makes me appreciate the ones that we still have that I can still text every day. I can still text Jerry Briscoe. I can still text Bret Hart. And I can still see all of you. And if it wasn't for all of you, and I mean that, everybody, because that's the other big thing is I'm appreciative of every promoter who's ever paid me or not paid me because it's been, it's been a lesson, you know? None of us are anything if it wasn't for the fans. Now, we can be egomaniacs and talk shit about how I'm the best, no, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. But the fact is that the seats are empty. There is no us. Now I know throughout my career, probably rubbed some people the wrong way. Some people like me, some don't. What I always had was the backing of legends. Teal, your father, who's my my hero, Roddy Piper. I think there's a reason I'm a wrestler today. And I remember the last time I saw him and he told me he was proud of me. So when people tell me that they don't like me or the internet's mad at me, I just kind of chuckle because Roddy Piper liked me. <laughs> Dusty Rhodes loved me. <laughs> I had the respect and the backing of Harley Race before I went to the WWE. And to me, that means more than all the money in the world. But because these legends put their stamp on me before anybody even knew who I was, it gave me the confidence and it gave me the ability to succeed.
succeed in a place where I don't think I ever fit in. And I've always struggled with a little bit of imposter syndrome. You know, it's a strange business. You're supposed to, you're supposed to just talk shit. You're supposed to tell everybody that you're the best. Everybody compares numbers. I drew this number. I made this much money. I won this title. I did this. I did that. Completely lost my train of thought. It's like one day I just woke up and I was an old timer and I was at the college flower alley. <laughs> I was flirting. I was 
flirt with right here. So he gets 17 shots of milk, and just like before, a little deja vu, the same waitress plunks down a shot in front of everybody, but this time last is Harley. Plunks a shot of milk right in front of Harley Race, and I'm sitting behind him, and I'm looking at him, and he does this. <laughs> is that milk? <laughs> I hold the shot glass and I went, yes, boss. And everyone waits, nobody's touching their shot glass. And Harley Race picks up the shot glass and he raises it to me. And then everyone else follows suit, down to the shot of milk, slams it in front of him. And he didn't beat me up. <laughs> and I figured at that point, if Harley Race accepted the punk rock kid from Chicago who wore basketball shorts and Doc Martens and had no business knowing or wrestling for Harley Race, that I was going to be okay. Everything else has been gravy since then. I have dreamed bigger and done things 15-year-old me never would have believed. And I've failed huge. But I think I've succeeded even bigger because I've learned from all those failures and it has been my pleasure and my honor and if I have made you happy in a wrestling ring, if I have made you mad in a wrestling ring, that's even better. Yeah. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.